And now it is my extreme pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, another founding member of AFTD's Medical Advisory Council, and a colleague who I'm honored to call a friend, another tremendous leader in this field. Dr. Bruce Miller is a professor of neurology at the University of California, San Francisco, where he directs the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. As a founding member of AFTD's Medical Advisory Council, he's an internationally recognized FTD expert with a longstanding interest in and commitment to FTD. His work over the last 40 plus years has helped to unravel the complexities of FTD, improve diagnostic accuracy, and understand the unique challenges and abilities of people living with an FTD diagnosis. In addition to being a singular figure in FTD science, significantly advancing our understanding of these disorders, Dr. Miller has provided compassionate, sympathetic care for countless people living with FTD, including many people attending this conference today. I've personally had the honor of working with him in the FTD space for more than 20 years, and I've seen the humanity that he brings to his work and FTD families across the country. Dr. Miller, we're honest, honored to have you with us today. Wow, so uh, thrilled to be with you all today. Um, so many friends, so many memories. Uh, 40 plus years, that's kind of, uh, hearing that from Susan, that's a long time. Uh, only thing I've done longer than that is uh, uh, being a husband. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, thank you for recognizing Murray Grossman. What, what a wonderful friend he was to all of us. A very fine man and a very original person who uh, really pioneered the way we think of the progressive aphasias. Uh, also, I'm really moved by uh, how AFTD has changed our world in, in so many ways. Uh, we have national initiatives funded by the NIH because of Susan, uh, her remarkable um, team. Uh, the humanization of our patients uh, uh, is just incredible. Anne Ferguson, uh, old friend and uh, one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. Uh, how incredible to have Anne representing patients with FTD. Hey, uh, um, so uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the WashU group. Uh, John Morris is here. Uh, he's just a remarkable leader. Um, uh, and uh, New, uh, Nooper is part of this group. Jorge Ibre is uh, leading new trials uh, that will soon, I think, enter all of our worlds. Uh, he is here. Um, uh, so thank you to WashU. And, um, really uh, excited to talk to you. So I uh, came to UCLA in, um, around 1980 to work with a man named Frank Benson, who was the world's authority uh, on the frontal lobes and a, a very uh, fine person as well. And I got interested in frontotemporal dementia during my fellowship between 1983 and 1985. And, um, at the time, no one other than Frank and uh, a few other people in Europe believed that there was a real disease called frontotemporal dementia, if you can imagine that. Didn't exist. Uh, it was a myth. Um, and so I got to see patients with Frank and hear about their stories. And um, Frank uh, convinced me that this was a very important uh, disorder that needed to be studied. And so uh, it's really also hard to believe remarkable uh, to see how much uh, the field has advanced uh, since that time when there was really no such thing as frontotemporal dementia. In my title, um, the most important word is hope. Uh, and, and I think there really is hope ahead. It's the most exciting time in my lifetime in frontotemporal dementia. Uh, it's exciting in terms of diagnosis. It's exciting in terms of education. And increasingly, diagnosis uh, means something in terms of therapies. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on that as well, because the therapies are coming, and they're, and they're coming fast and furious. So um, Arnold Pick, a great neuropsychiatrist from Czechoslovakia, uh, first described uh, patients with frontotemporal dementia. He, he really described patients with progressive aphasia um, in 1892. 
he was really pioneering in a couple ways. One, he realized that degenerative diseases could start focally. Um, and in the case of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, they start in the frontal lobes um, bilaterally. In the case of the progressive aphasias, they start on the left side of the brain, the language side. And, and so, so Pick was fascinated by this idea that you could have a degenerative disease that began uh, in the early stages in, on one side of the brain. Um, he uh, emphasizes preferentially hit the front, not the back part of the brain, not the hippocampus. Um, and we knew very little at the time about what the frontal lobes and the anterior temporal lobes actually do. I think all of you know much better even than the genius pick uh, from your own personal experiences, what happens when the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes don't work. Um, uh, he, just, uh, he did not describe the inclusions that now carry his name, the pick bodies. They were actually described by Alzheimer. But you know, I, I think really this remarkable man did so much. Uh, and although we no longer think about uh, pick uh, in the setting of um, degenerative disease, he, he really was the pioneer. He set it uh, all up. So when I was growing up in this field, there was a phrase, and it was, don't pick Pick's disease. What, what did that mean? It, it meant that one uh, neurologist believed that this could not be differentiated from Alzheimer's disease. Um, imagine that. A disease like frontotemporal dementia that hits the front of the brain couldn't be differentiated from Alzheimer's, which hits the back of the brain. It shows you how far we have come from that time. The other idea was so rare. I remember hearing this 1978 in my neuropath uh, class, one of my last classes in medical school. You'll never, never see a case. It's uh, so rare. Even neurologists rarely see a case. And then the third part of this, and I think oh, this is really one of the huge impediments to diagnosis. The idea was, uh, well, we don't really, as neurologists, study behavior. This isn't really in our domain. Uh, of course, the whole brain is involved with behavior. So think of separating out all of that uh, from your specialty. And psychiatry, uh, no excuses. They were just as bad. Uh, they weren't interested in this disease either. And you know, uh, they believed that this was a psychodynamic, uh, something that the parents did or something. Um, so it was really, really a time where no one pick, picks disease. But we've learned that those people were wrong. Um, the first uh, uh, set of studies that suggested that they were wrong was came out of John Hodges in Cambridge. And he showed that in Cambridge, where they had a huge sweep uh, of all dementia, uh, all of them came to see John. Um, almost one-to-one um, -one Alzheimer's disease in front of temporal dementia in people under the age of uh, 65. David Notman from Mayo soon afterwards showed that uh, it's the most common disease uh, under the age of 60. And uh, I saw that up on one of the slides. It's right. It's really good research. So this is the common uh, cause for neurodegeneration. Um, I don't think we have good epidemiologic estimates of this. AFTD's done great work to uh, capture this as best as we can. But one of the problems is a lot of diseases that are really so close to from a temporal degeneration that they should be considered as part of the spectrum are separated. So ALS, 90% of the people with ALS have aggregates of the TDP43 protein associated with frontotemporal dementia. Many people with ALS develop a frontotemporal degeneration um, just like FTD. Uh, two disorders that were originally studied by movement people, PSP and cortical basal degeneration, are, are really, I think, subtypes of uh, frontotemporal degeneration. And won't talk about it today, but chronic traumatic encephalopathy and McKee's beautiful work from Boston University has shown um, that uh, the uh, NFL football players who develop a behavioral syndrome and motor disorders, sometimes ALS, <clears throat> very, very strongly uh, linked to the frontotemporal degenerations. Is it rare after the age of 70? The answer is no. 
Um, uh, a quarter of the cases in our cohort happened in people over the age of 65. One of the themes from this paper for, from Dr. So in, in um, Korea was that if you got frontotemporal degeneration after the age of uh, 65, more likely to have the tau protein in the brain under 65, more likely to have the TDP43 protein. And then I, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but we have these magnificent brain banks across the uh, country that follow people um, from different disorders to death. And one of the themes uh, in all of these brain banks is that people we call Alzheimer's disease, um, particularly old and very old, over the age of 70, uh, over the age of 80, have lots of other uh, degenerative proteins in the brain as well, including TDP43. Whether that's a form of FTD, uh, I think is debated, not clear, but I think it just emphasizes that uh, the diseases that we are, are interested in are common, important, need to be studied, need to be treated, um, need to be recognized in, in the society. So what about this idea that you can't differentiate uh, frontotemporal uh, disorders from Alzheimer's? It's just frankly wrong. I think good clinicians, um, and many of you are good clinicians, because many of you were the first one to recognize this uh, illness before your doctors do. Um, and you teach physicians and caregivers of, about this illness. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not difficult. One, one of the goals, we have a NIH-funded project that I started in 2004, now led by Marilu Gorno-Tempini uh, and uh, Howie Rosen and, and Bill Seeley. The hope of this is that every patient with uh, FTD not only uh, will be diagnosed properly, but will be able to tell you the di different molecular subtypes, the specific proteins responsible for that person with FTD. Why is that important? Because people like Jorge Ibre are beginning to treat the molecules. So if we can diagnose people properly down to the molecule that causes their illness, then they will be eligible for treatment studies. A little bit about diagnosis. Um, this is an old study, but uh, I think it replicates experience across the world. Almost all of the people that we see with FTD originally given a psychiatric diagnosis in the community. Um, I think that's because in general in our society, we tend to dissociate behavior from the brain. If behavior changes, the brain has changed. That was a principle my teacher, Frank Benson, taught me. Uh, one of the interesting things from this study by Josh Woolley, psychiatrist, is that women in particular are prone to misdiagnosis. So 70% of the people uh, in our cohort here who had FTD uh, were called psychiatric, uh, usually about two years before they actually hit our center. Is that bad? It's really bad. Um, because I think increasingly we know we want to get treatments early. If we are not capturing FTD in the early stages, the therapies that are being developed will not be effective. So this is really an AFTD problem. It's our uh, Alzheimer and FTD centers problems. It's societal problem. Um, and we'll think together about ways to change that. Um, here are some of the psychiatric syndromes that I have seen in the course of uh, my uh, years looking after people with FTD. Um, they're called, uh, and sometimes they look like a primary psychiatric disease before they actually develop a uh, frontotemporal syndrome. But look at the broad spectrum of uh, illnesses that uh, can mimic FTD. I think. One of the key points here, and, and I think our psychiatric uh, community doesn't realize this, is that this isn't just relevant to frontotemporal degeneration. This is relevant to psychiatry because we know the anatomy of these people. If they develop a bipolar type presentation uh, with FTD, we know exactly where in the brain there is a change. So I, I think profound implications from uh, uh, the psychiatric syndromes to the broader field of, of psychiatry. But also, I think, thinking about early, we have to get in to clinics where people are first diagnosed uh, uh, with a behavioral change 
called psychiatric because that's when I think often our diseases uh, first manifest. We developed research criteria for uh, the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia um, in 2011. Really a massive international effort. Um, and they're unlike any research criteria I know of in neurology. Look at how strongly they emphasize early onset of behavioral changes. Disinhibition, um, doing things that are inappropriate, apathy, loss of empathy. This to me is incredibly profound. Um, it's profound for the caregiver, it's profound um, uh, for understanding science. That a disease that attacks the uh, anterior temporal lobes, particularly the right one, uh, strips us of our ability to empathize with someone else. Uh, think of uh, what that means uh, for a caregiver, uh, where uh, sometimes the first manifestation of the illness is that they don't care about their children. They don't care about their grandchildren. John Morris and I were just talking about our grandkids. I guarantee you, we don't have frontotemporal dementia. <laughs> uh, seeing the beam and the pictures, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, repetitive compulsive behaviors, often called um, obsessive compulsive disorder, overeating. About 60% of our patients uh, gain uh, at least 10 pounds in the early stages of the illness. And then finally, when the neuropsychologists sit these uh, patients down, they have loss of what we call executive uh, function, planning, organizing, sequencing, but their visual spatial skills are spared uh, so they can draw beautifully. And, and as I'll touch on at the end of my talk, some patients with uh, FTD actually become artists in the setting of the degenerative disease. Um, I'll come back to the implications of that in a, mo a moment. What percentage of the people that we see um, have atrophy on the MRI? M almost all of them. So I think the, the punchline here is if uh, people with the FTD syndrome actually had an MRI scan, um, it, it would be very high likelihood diagnostic. A lot of them don't get an MRI scan because they're considered psychiatric or something else. Um, and then Mutations. Mutations uh, are changing the way we think about uh, FTD, uh, and I think lots of therapies uh, devoted to the mutations that can cause uh, FTD. And I'll come back to that in, in just a moment or two. <clears throat> Antisocial behavior, uh, very common with FTD. I don't have to tell this audience about that. Um, this is a study we did with uh, Madeline Lilligren, George Nassan. Uh, we looked at all of our FTD patients and asked the question, what percentage of them actually developed an antisocial behavior that could have been classified as a crime or was classified as a crime? I, I have written really tens, maybe hundreds of letters uh, to the legal system <clears throat> about my patients uh, because uh, these are never recognized as caused by a degenerative disorder. Um, and it's a real tragedy of the illness. It doesn't happen late in the uh, course of the illness. Sometimes it happens before someone ever gets a diagnosis. Uh, and so I, I think we've thought a lot about the sorts of disinhibited behaviors that lead to antisocial behaviors. They're, they're often very poorly planned out crimes. A patient with FTD walks into a, a store, they're hungry, they go to the ice cream uh, section, uh, eat the ice cream, uh, uh, walk out without paying, uh, have to pay, uh, uh, end up going to, uh, to, to jail. Th these are the sorts of things that we see with FTD, but certainly very disruptive to families. And families have to organize uh, the lives of themselves and the, and the individual with this disease to prevent these uh, antisocial acts. Um, loss of empathy, uh, incredibly common. Um, Kate Rankin uh, has done pioneering work in this space and uh, she has uh, shown that if your disease begins in the right anterior temporal lobe, um, more than 50% of the people, families say, the first thing that they notice was loss of empathy. Uh, someone has a medical illness, the patient with FTD doesn't care. Um, cruelty to children, to animals, to elders. 
um, things that were totally outside the spectrum of what uh, they uh, used to see. Remember uh, one of my uh, very smart caregivers uh, talking about her mother, and they were driving in a car together, and uh, she had, the, uh, the daughter had to uh, let off uh, 50 of her employees, and she started to cry talking about uh, this. And the, the mother giggled and laughed and uh, uh, continued on uh, as if nothing had happened. Um, we have uh, learned that people with FTD don't recognize emotions in other people. They don't feel the same emotion that we do when they see something as sad or um, uh, surprising or frightening. And I think this lack of feeling um, is a profound part of why they have uh, difficulty. Um, isn't this interesting? So we have a right anterior temporal lobe that's really important for recognizing faces, emotions in faces, people, and it's part of an empathy network. And when that empathy network degenerates, um, you see uh, profound uh, behavioral changes that affect an entire family. Um, just uh, one quick comment about psychosis. I used to think this was really unusual in FTD. Did a study uh, when I was at UCLA in the 80s. It was about 10% of our cohort. But what we've realized uh, is that the genetic forms of FTD have a very high prevalence of psychosis. These are often grandiose uh, or paranoid psychoses. Uh, uh, people believe they've won the uh, lottery. Uh, they buy a yacht when they have no money in their bank account. Um, they believe that they have become uh, uh, official of, of some importance. Um, and so the interesting thing about this pathology-based study that we did is uh, almost all the patients with psychosis with FTD, it was about 30% of our, our, our cohort, um, uh, had TDP43 as the protein. Very rare with tau. So I, I think we're starting to bundle up these different types of symptoms and think about which ones are associated with tau, which ones are associated with TDP43, which are related to genetic mutations, which are not. Um, but I think this is the beginnings of our ability to diagnose uh, everyone that we see with FTD down to the specific molecule. This is a word for many of you caregivers in the audience. Um, uh, our nurses, Jennifer Merrilies, AFTD, a uh, number of groups across the world uh, have shown that this is an incredibly burdensome disorder. It hit its people in their 50s often, so caregivers are young, uh, often working, sometimes caring for a parent with a degenerative disease, and all of, all of a sudden their full life burden is caring for someone who they've loved for many, many decades. The study that was done here um, by Alice Hua with Bob Levinson, Jennifer Merrilies, uh, sort of flipped the question backwards. They said, um, what is the likelihood that a caregiver will develop psychiatric uh, problems, we call this psychopathology, uh, or actually changes in their global health? So illnesses like heart attacks. Um, one of the first things I learned at UCLA in the 1980s was that a a lot of times, the loved one died before the patient. And that's because of this unbelievable stress that uh, FTD creates. AFTD is the sort of antidote to that. All of you working in your communities are antidotes, but it, we need better antidotes still. I mean, I think this is just fierce. Um, uh, so what we discovered was that the brain itself of the patient determined how much stress the caregivers had. So if you had a patient with atrophy in the front part of the brain, the insula, um, that you were much more likely to experience caregiver psychopathology or actually changes in your global health. Um, the, the, the findings in this study was uh, there was significant caregiver stress, and I would say this happens to professionals as well. For those of you who work with these families, you know how many crises there are, how many possibly difficult problems that you deal with. It endangers the caregiver and the patient with FTD, the behavior. Uh, it reduces quality of life for both. Um, 
Uh, it accelerates uh, functional decline um, and increases the risk of placement if the caregiver develops uh, psychopathology or physical illness. So no surprise to you, your health is critical to how well your loved one does, and uh, that's why you have to look after yourselves. There are all sorts of important things related to that. And of course, the behaviors lead to chemical restraints that uh, increase the likelihood that your loved one with FTD will die. So th th this is at the core of this illness, and uh, you know I think solutions uh, are really are needed in, in many different uh, areas. Uh, just briefly, um, when I uh, think about treatment of behavior, first I identify what the behavior is, then I try to decide, uh, should it be treated? If someone's uh, got a compulsive behavior that doesn't affect others, maybe that's just okay. A lot of times uh, people say, should I treat apathy? And often I say no. I think apathy uh, uh, protects you uh, and the patient from the behaviors that might be there. Uh, uh, so you treat the apathy and then you see the disinhibition, the antisocial behavior. So I, I think sometimes a big question about what should be treated and what shouldn't. Um, uh, I start with the family. I think, I think about how do I protect the family? Many different ways. Interventions uh, in the environment are often critical. When someone comes to me and says, my loved one has a behavior with FTD, I often begin by saying, well, we're going to try to treat this and we're going to think of medicines, but they may not work. And you may have to think that you. And went out, ah, great. Love the sound of my voice. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, we think SSRIs, uh, antidepressants, help some people, not all. And a lot of the drugs that are used for Alzheimer's make people worse. Uh, memantine, cholinesterase inhibitors, Aricept. I think some of the worst behavioral syndromes I've ever seen in FTD are caused by someone being given Aricept. Take the Aricept away, the behavior improves. So this is a distinct disease, and it needs its own distinct treatments. Uh, talk to someone who said, you know, when you guys start talking about all of the you know, deep science of this, I don't understand. So I'm, I'm gonna try to make this really understandable. I, I, but I, I just wanna emphasize that we have three major types of frontotemporal dementia. Behavioral variant, it hits anterior frontal temporal lobes bilaterally, sometimes right more than less. We have two language variants, one called semantic, where you have trouble with words. Uh, and then you have a non-fluent variant where people have difficulty speaking, their speaking is effortful. They lose the ability to speak in whole sentences. This wouldn't matter very much, except that it is highly predictive of the underlying molecule. So if you have the non-fluent variant, I'm pretty sure you have tau as a cause for your neurodegenerative condition. In our brain bank, 85% have tau. Uh, even more so, some of the others have a mutation in the progranulin green, uh, gene. So if we see someone and we want to give an anti-tau uh, drug, and they have a non-fluent aphasia, and they don't have a progranulin gene, we're pretty happy about putting them into a clinical trial. We know what they have, and we know what we're treating. The semantic variant is really the opposite. These people have uh, TDP43 as the cause. Uh, for the neurodegeneration. Many of those people have an inflammatory signal as well, autoimmune disease. Uh, uh, Peter Yubenkoff at UCSF has started an anti-inflammatory uh, drug trial for people with semantic variant. So different clinical syndromes, but really more important, different underlying molecules. BVFTD is more complicated. We're not very good at predicting whether you have tau or TDP43. Uh, that makes it really hard for clinical trials if we can't you know, determine which mechanism is responsible for the illness. Um, the uh, BVFTD is very strongly genetic, um, and I think increasingly um, we want all of the people with FTD, and we're, we're working on national efforts to get this funded, that everyone with FTD will get a whole genome, so we'll know exactly what is responsible for the FTD in that person, 
What are the relevance to the family as well? Um, the three big genes are tau, um, and uh, this tends to present younger. We've uh, recently Anyone like to see me sing? No. Mm. Okay. I would dance. It's nonverbal, uh, but uh, you don't want to see that. No. Okay. Um, so the tau mutations very common in young people with familial forms of FTD. What are we going to do with these? We're going to turn off the bad tau gene. What if you have sporadic form of frontotemporal degeneration with tau aggregations? We're going to turn off the tau gene. Um, all sorts of really smart therapies emerging in this space, uh, ranging from antibodies to something called antisense oligonucleotides that go to the gene and turn it off. We have a brilliant physician at UCSF named Claire Cleland who is working with CRISPR, with the inventor of CRISPR, Jennifer Dudna, to use CRISPR to turn off the tau gene. I think if we can get people with the tau form of FTD early, uh, we will be able to find a prevention. Um, and that's why these familial forms are so darn important. Granulin, a very different story. This is a protein that uh, seems to be very uh, important for growth of neurons, the stability of neurons, and also uh, helps the neuron to degrade bad proteins. Uh, it's a deficiency. So if you have the progranulin form of frontotemporal dementia, uh, you are deficient in progranulin. Um, pretty simple therapy. You have to boost progranulin in the brain. We have more, almost more companies with smart therapies for progranulin than we do patients. So this is, a, I think, a, a really important time. Uh, seriously, we have eight companies right now with different approaches to increasing granulin in the brain um, uh, that I think will be effective uh, if we can get in early enough. But uh, these, stu uh, these studies have been slowed because of uh, too few uh, patients. C9 ORF72 is the most common gene in our population. It causes FTD and ALS. Um, uh, it's due to an abnormality in the C9 gene. It becomes too big. Uh, how are we going to cure this? We're going to cut it out. Uh, that's where Claire Cleland has worked with, uh, with CRISPR. Uh, she thinks she's about four years away from a clinical trial related to CRISPR. So let's uh, all cheer on Claire, because this is really, really important. Um, one of the things I'm so proud of uh, are, uh, and these were touched on by Newper, uh, Artful and Lefties. And these are large studies now, thousands of people in them uh, who are at risk for FTD or, or have FTD. 
We have sporadic, people we don't know why they got it, and familial. Uh, these studies are entering people every day. Um, the, the studies are trying to help the people who do clinical trials determine um, uh, what is the course of this illness. If we go to the FDA with a clinical trial, uh, will they accept any of our biomarkers uh, as an endpoint for the FDA to approve a drug? So this work that many of you are participating in is so important. Great work done in uh, Europe uh, through Genfi. They work so well together. Their data sets are harmonized. There's no competition in this world. The uh, competition is with the disease. South America, I help with Augustin Ebenez lead a major effort. We're going to study 6,000 people. Uh, we think 3,000 will have FTD. Uh, so all of these uh, efforts uh, are bringing more and more patients uh, uh, into studies. What is FTD like? It's just like Alzheimer's disease. Bad proteins are aggregating the brain um, maybe 15 to 20 years before someone gets sick. That's why the genetic forms are, are so valuable, because you can study someone 20 years before they're ill and, and think about what's going on uh, in a very precise way. About 10 years before someone gets sick, we start to see things like um, uh, that we can see clinically. Uh, with C9RF72, people start to leak a protein from neurons called neurofilament. That means that uh, the in, uh, neurons are uh, being injured in some way. Around five years before someone gets sick, and I think all of you have your own stories, someone is starting to show behavioral changes or subtle changes in language. Um, and then the disease uh, begins and they go fast. Um, uh, with uh, progranulin in particular, we think uh, you know, the massive atrophy uh, in the year that someone presents massive leakage of the neurofilament protein. Uh, uh, so these biomarkers that we're developing, MRI, the neurofilament, we're going to the FDA. Adam Boxer is going to the FDA. Uh, Jorge is going to the FDA and saying, we think this biomarker, if it changes, if neurofilament normalizes in someone with a drug, this means the drug is working. What that means is we don't need thousands of people in clinical trials. We need hundreds, maybe even less than hundreds. So that's why these longitudinal studies are so darn important. Uh, neurofilament uh, is becoming really a incredibly good biomarker, certainly for C9, certainly for progranulin. Um, uh, and these, what these uh, images show that uh, well, uh, uh, once you start getting sick with uh, FTD, uh, the neurofilament uh, is starting to elevate, not only in your spinal fluid. I love plasma biomarkers because I don't love uh, doing lumbar punctures as much. But in the blood, we can actually show the uh, effect of the disease uh, on the brain. Uh, so this is a very, very exciting time. Um, beyond the drugs, is there anything we can do? Uh, this is work by Caitlin Casaletto that I'm very proud of. Uh, and what Caitlin uh, has shown is that even in the genetics forms of FTD, if you have, um, if, if you have um, C9, um, progranulin, or tau, and you're not sick yet, if you have increased baseline uh, activity, you are much less likely to progress to neurodegeneration. The same is true for cognitive activity. So I think these are the beginnings of very uh, important thinking about intervention. Um, and yes, we can do something. Uh, and just like in Alzheimer's disease, uh, lifestyle is important. So begin to think about um, this uh, in your own lives and uh, in the lives of Well, this is my slide of optimism. This is hope. This slide right here is uh, as much as words can show hope. And uh, these are the treatments for the different forms of FTD. 
Uh, I never would have believed it when I uh, started in this field. But uh, over the next decade, I believe we will see effective therapies for the different forms of FTD. I think getting as many people into clinical trials is uh, going to be really important. Um, and uh, I think this reflects an enormous creativity of scientists in our field in the different ways they're thinking about therapies. And of course, AFTD has been a major funder, a uh, major stimulant for uh, all of these clinical trials. Okay. This is some harmonic sound from the, I don't know, where in the universe it's coming from. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to end with a little bit of hope too, and that's about creativity. Um, so we humans, I think uh, around 50,000 years ago, started to show visual creativity. Uh, the caves of Lascaux are, are one example of them. Uh, but not just Europe, uh, beautiful uh, art uh, in, in the Andes uh, around 11,000 years ago. Uh, South Africa, we see work uh, going back maybe um, to 50,000 years ago. So this uh, probably the first painting comes from Indonesia. So we see this explosion of visual creativity associated with our species, which I think meant that there was a change in the brain. Uh, you know, we are unique uh, compared to other apes, including Neanderthals, uh, and uh, we are unique compared to other species on this planet in this visual uh, skill. Uh, I'm not going to overemphasize uh, this, but the left side of the brain is responsible for verbal creativity, writing, speaking, poems. Uh, the right side is much more visual. Uh, so what happens if you turn off the left side of the brain with a progressive aphasia. Uh, I guess in retrospect, this isn't how we discovered this. We just saw it happen because families were smart. Um, but uh, you might hypothesize if the left side of the brain turned off, you might see visual creativity. Um, indeed, that's uh, what we do uh, see. Um, this is the semantic variant where I think a surprisingly high people uh, with this particular type of uh, FTD, uh, exhibit uh, visual fascination. Sometimes it's beautiful gardens, sometimes it's uh, uh, ga gas chromatography, uh, sometimes it's actual painting. Um, uh, I'll say a, uh, just a word about that in a second. So uh, realize that creativity in FTD is not rare. Uh, uh, it happens, uh, I think, uniquely to this disorder, much less common in Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is Ann Adams, uh, who uh, was a biologist at the University of British Columbia. She uh, started to paint uh, when her son got ill, uh, quit working uh, as a, a biologist, um, and started to paint. This is Ann's masterpiece. It's called Unraveling Bolero, or Unraveling Ravel. And what she did was she took bolero, gave each uh, meter a note, her favorite note, a color, and represented bolero, uh, which is a very unique piece of music visually, um, as, uh, the, uh, as the work got louder, you see the notes got longer, um, and uh, then there is a, a, a crash uh, as the piece ends. Uh, we got a hold of one of Anne's notebooks uh, when she was doing this, um, and uh, you can see the meticulous work she did over many months trying to capture visually what Bolero sounded like. Um, as it turns out, Ravel, uh, about three years after he wrote this piece, developed the same progressive aphasia that Anne did. So cross time, cross space, uh, different people obsessed with this particular piece of music. Uh, Ravel hated it. He said it wasn't music, it was an uh, experiment in sound. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we think that the change in Ravel's brain with the progressive aphasia before the disease started was responsible for him creating this magnificent piece of music, just like Anne's piece was a magnificent visual representation. Um, not going to show Anne's uh, whole work, but this is not a photograph, this is gouache of rocks. Um, and so she painted almost to the time she died with a progressive aphasia. 
what we learned from Anne, and this is Bill Seeley's work, is that <clears throat> when Anne started her uh, painting, before she actually had a aphasia, the left uh, frontal insular region, where progressive non-fluent aphasia begins, was statistically smaller than 30 age match controls. This brilliant scientist was developing degeneration in the left frontal region um, before she actually manifested an aphasia. No surprise. But more remarkable, what you see in red is the back of her brain where we imagine and visualize the world uh, was actually statistically bigger uh, than 30 age match controls. This isn't Anne, this is neurodegeneration. Uh, as one circuit turns down before we see clinical evidence of the disease, other circuits in the brain are increasing. So this combination of our own weaknesses and our own strengths, we believe increasingly is going to be important in getting in in the very earliest stages of these diseases. Uh, so I think Anne's magnificent story, which I'll say a word about in just a slide or two, uh, uh, tells us not only about Anne, but all of us, all of our own unique humanity, our weaknesses, our strengths, the way our brains work. Um, so we looked, uh, Adit Friedberg did this, all the FTD artists that we have seen. Um, we found 17 artists with really good data. It, it's not an incredibly high percentage, but it's about 2.5% of all of the people we have with FTD. Nothing like this in Alzheimer's disease. Eight of them became artists, never slightest interest in art. Seven, a little interest, but never really painted in a significant way. And, and two were previous artists whose work changed. What we saw was that in this group, that the place where the degeneration was most profound was the anterior temporal lobe. Uh, so we think this degeneration in the anterior uh, part of the brain, uh, often on the left, uh, is the trigger for rewiring in posterior parts of the brain. What Adit showed was that the occipital lobes and the parietal lobes in the back are actually, in all FTD patients, upregulated. So uh, this region uh, is uh, increasing in its activity. Uh, if my uh, posterior uh, brain started to visualize things and see things, it wouldn't translate into good painting. I know it wouldn't. But if I had the right substrate, uh, uh, like some of our artists, it really might. Um, one of the really fascinating things that she said, and it shows something I think about neurodegeneration, is that the, the left motor strip, the right hand, the hand that these artists are using to paint, was actually uh, strongly uh, statistically correlated uh, with the uh, uh, occipital region. So this uh, visual drive associated with motor activity, the volume actually increases. So you are able to train the hand to uh, perfect the uh, production of art. Um, what does the art look like? Bright colors, uh, rarely focused on the human face. When present, facial expressions are bizarre. The FTD artist represents the face the way they see it. Um, doesn't convey natural emotions. Um, uh, you can see that uh, duck-like uh, figure. That's one of my favorite patients. Just beautiful uh, welding. He, he welded uh, art, uh, didn't uh, sculpt it. OK, so I'm going to end with this. And uh, uh, this is a joint project between FTD and um, uh, AFTD and the Conservatory of Music and our Global Brain Health Program at UCSF. We believe that you uh, and artists are much better at telling the story of FTD than we are as scientists. So I think increasingly we think it's important to get the arts involved uh, with um, our patients, with our patient population. We have a fellow, Jake Broder, who's written a play about Ann Adams uh, and her husband, Robert. It's an incredibly moving play. Uh, it talks about caregivers and what, how hard it is for a caregiver. It also shows Anne inspired to paint in the setting of this neurodegenerative disease. Ravel takes part in this. We are going to make a movie for this. We're doing a fundraiser with AFTD. 
Um, but I think with the now Bruce Willis, a patient with FTD, uh, our, our uh, disorder is starting to get a human face. And I think the more that we can publicize this story, the more that you can tell your stories through artists, uh, uh, those of you who are artists telling it with your own, own hands or voice, I think the quicker the society will be to recognize this problem and the quicker we will all be to uh, have new therapies for FTD. So thank you all. I apologize for the wine. Um, I didn't mean to do it. Um, and um, uh, anyways, uh, thank you. Uh, what a